Jesus is holding a coin. Just imagine a coin sitting in the palm of your hand. The image on the front of the coin is the head of the emperor Tiberius. And the inscription round the edge reads, Caesar Augustus Tiberius, son of the divine Augustus. That's what you read round the edge of a denarius. Do you see why this was problematic for a devout first century Jew? First it's blasphemous to claim that the Emperor Augustus was divine. Second, the very existence of the coin symbolises Roman occupation. The Jews are forced to use the coinage of a foreign power. This is how the Pharisees try to trap Jesus and they ask him whether it's permissible to pay Roman taxes. If he says yes, he's a collaborator. If he says no, he becomes a revolutionary. So he replies with one of the most famous lines in the Bible when he says, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. Well, what on earth does that mean? Is he saying, possibly, it's okay to keep your public life and your religious practice completely separate? Or is he saying in a much more radical way, have nothing to do with Roman money. This coin belongs to Caesar and completely withdraw from public life into religious isolation. Or is he saying maybe, pay your taxes and be loyal citizens, but remember that public authority is not divine and you must measure the laws of the land against the rule of natural justice and the law of God and keep your deepest allegiance to him. Well, you can guess where I'm going. This last option is how the Catholic Church has traditionally understood Jesus' teaching and still does. To have a qualified respect for public authority and the norms of civil society but to judge that society against the norms of goodness, truth and justice. As St Thomas More said, here in London, just before his martyrdom, I die the king's good servant, but God's first. All of this comes under the heading of what's called Catholic social teaching, which is such a rich part of our tradition. It means that as Christians we don't withdraw from society into a holy bubble. We're called to transform society, to make the world a better place. Jesus says elsewhere that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. <clears throat> Catholic social teaching has some core principles that give a foundation to Christian social activity and a guarantee that this activity is truly serving the common good and not just one sector of society. And be careful here. The common good, in this understanding, is not just a society with lots of good things, nor is it just a society where people get what they want. One of the best definitions is from St. John the Twenty-Third. He said the common good is, quote, the sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as a group or as, an, or as individuals, to reach their fulfilment more fully and more easily. Isn't that nice? It allows us to reach our fulfilment more fully and more easily. A good society is one that helps people to be happy, to be good, and ultimately to be holy. Look, I'm just going to list here, very quickly, 12 principles of Catholic social teaching, just in a list. And as I speak, see if any of them are new to you, or surprise you. 
Or see if out of these twelve, one of them is maybe speaking to you and you're thinking, yes, I need to think about that in my life, or I want to learn about that. Here they are. Every list is different. This is my list. One, the inalienable dignity of every human being from conception to natural death. The sanctity of life. Two, marriage and family life as the bedrock of society, as the fundamental unit that allows individuals to grow and flourish. Three, respect for legitimate authority, legitimate authority, and the rule of law, and the duty of participating in civic life and actively working for justice and equity in law, politics, economics and society. Four, the right and sometimes the duty to conscientious objection when you believe a law to be unjust. Five, lots of these are in pairs, listen to this. Five, the right to private property as a way of protecting the rights of the person. But six, what's called the universal destination of goods, which is the conviction that everything in creation exists for the good of all, and not just for the private benefit of individuals. Seven, the dignity of work, so the economy serves the people, and not the other way round and where workers have rights of association and to just wages and humane working conditions. Eight, religious freedom. Nine, the duty to care for creation and the development of an integrated, holistic ecology. Ten, what's called in Catholic teaching, quote, a preferential option for the poor. A preferential option for the poor. Meaning we put the needs of the poorest and the most vulnerable at the centre of our concerns and not the periphery as an add-on. And 11 and 12, another pair, 11, solidarity, which refers to our interdependence, our need to belong, and therefore the importance of having institutions and obligations and customs that bind us together. And twelve, subsidiarity. Subsidiarity, an unusual word which refers, this is, I can't remember where I picked this phrase up, it's about the importance of localism localism against the danger of excessive centralization and sometimes authoritarianism. It's how authority needs to be dispersed. Small is beautiful and local communities often do things better. There's my list, a long list. And look, I'm aware it's Sunday morning and this sounds like a lecture rather than a homily. But it's important that you know this stuff. The gospel is not just a vague exhortation to say your prayers and be nice to people. It is a passionate defence of the human person and what it means to build a just society where all persons can flourish. And it, it, and it involves some concrete values that form the heart of Catholic social teaching. You're called to live these values. Not just to parrot them, you're called to live them, and to do that you need to know them first. They can inspire you to do great things, and they can challenge you to discern what is truly worthwhile. All the dreams I have, great, but which of them are truly worthwhile? And just in brackets here, do you see this is not to do with being left-wing or right-wing? with being pro-Brexit or pro-Remain, with being royalist or republican. You can have two faithful Catholics sincerely disagreeing about politics or policy as long as their core values are just 
and for the Catholic as long as their core values are founded on the teaching of Christ and the teaching of his church. And you see how rich this teaching is. That's why I wanted to take the risk of giving, giving you a big chunky list. Because it takes away the idea that to do good you have to work for a charity or an NGO. Now, if you want to work for a charity or an NGO, wonderful, go for it. But you might equally decide to work for the public sector, or to set up your own business, or go into academia. You might want to give your time to bringing up your children, or caring for sick relatives. There are so many thousands of different ways of working for the common good. You have to find what is right for you, instead of just defaulting into what is fashionable or easy. And much of this is just being a Christian. It's ordinary life. In your daily life, I hope, without this sermon, you're just trying to be kind, honest, truthful, generous, fair, forgiving. You help to build a good society, first of all, just by being a good person. You're just living your faith in the world, and your values are shaping the communities in which you live. Automatically, subconsciously as it were. But there are moments when building a good society requires you to step out and take a stand. Maybe this has happened to you recently. Your conscience moves you to speak up about something important, to join a campaign, to promote something on Facebook, to volunteer, to give to a good cause financially, to run for office in your university or work or town. Catholic social teaching is usually just implicit, unsaid, but sometimes it needs to become explicit in your life and you need to say this is what I believe and this is why it's important. And sometimes your conscience will cause you to stand against some injustice in society that many others perhaps cannot see or they're ignoring it or even willingly colluding with it. This is hard. We need wisdom to know when is it necessary to take a stand or when is it sometimes better to wait or to work within the system. But when we do need to take a stand in conscience we need to have real courage and we need the support of those we love. I already quoted St Thomas More who stood against the injustice of King Henry's adultery and the injustice of his attack on the unity of the church. Let me finish with something about blessed Oscar Romero, who was the subject of the UCL talk on Monday. As a priest and a young bishop in El Salvador, Romero had a great love for Christ and a real dedication to the poor. But through the 1970s he became more and more aware that the hardship of the poor was not an accident of fate but a consequence of the way society was structured and above all of the murderous repression of the government security forces. He couldn't remain silent. Let me read from this account given by the Romero Trust of the, the final months and years of Romero's life. I quote, In February 1977, Romero was the surprising choice to be the new Archbishop of San Salvador. Over the next three years, the social and political conf conflict in El Salvador intensified, with electoral fraud blocking change and peaceful protest being met with massacres and death squad killings. From his cathedral pulpit, Archbishop Romero became the voice of the voiceless poor. There, in a society of cover-up and lies, he spoke the truth 
of what was happening in the countryside. He denounced the killings, the torture and the disappearances of community leaders. He demanded justice and recompense for the atrocities committed by the army and police and he set up legal aid projects and pastoral programs to support the victims of the violence. With the emergence of armed guerrilla groups on the far left, civil war loomed. Romero, rejecting the violence perpetuated by the left as well as the right, strained every nerve to promote peaceful solutions to his nation's crisis. He was vilified in the press attacked and denounced to Rome by Catholics of the wealthy classes, harassed by the security forces and publicly opposed by several Episcopal colleagues. The death threats multiplied, the atmosphere was charged. Archbishop Romero realised he was going to be killed and he came to accept it. At six o'clock on March the 24th, 1980, with a single marksman's bullet, he fell at the foot of a huge crucifix. He died a Eucharistic martyr, a martyr to the option for the poor, a martyr to the magisterium of the church, and now recognised as blessed Oscar Romero. End of quote. I pray that you will never have to face the horror that Oscar Romero faced. But I also pray that you will have the same love that motivated him, the same passion for truth and justice, the same clarity of vision that allowed him to discern what needed to be done, and the same willingness when the moment comes to stand up for what you believe to be right.